as well for your patience. Um, I would ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, letters of support and resolutions from various of our small municipal uh, jurisdictions out in my congressional district in our state. Um, well, one of those that's not small, the City of Baltimore, um, but uh, cities like College Park, Capitol Heights, Edmonston, Forest Heights, Mount Rainier, New Carrollton, and the City of Rockville. Um, letters of support from them, as well as from Clean Water Action, um, supporting their efforts from more than 30 of our state senators and legislators who have deep experience in working on these issues in the state of Maryland. Um, a letter from Union Craft Brewing Company, Heavy Seas Brewing Company, and um, the small uh, bed and biscuit, Hereford uh, bed and biscuit in Parkton, Maryland, and I'd offer those for the record. Yeah, without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And um, again, thanks to the witnesses, um, because I've heard from you numerous times. And to me, it seems fairly you know, clear. And I'm no expert, but I think like most Americans, I want to just get up, turn on the water, know that I can drink it, wash with it, and that it's clean. Uh, my children aren't going to get sick. I, w my immune system won't be uh, jeopardized. And we depend on the government uh, to do that. We depend on the, um, on the EPA and on the Army Corps. And so with uh, the two Supreme Court decisions and the guidance documents that were issued in 2003 and 2008, um, it's my understanding that the regulated community conservation and environmental organizations, several states, concede that the current process that's been in place, and really, you know, for the better part of a decade, that kind of uncertainty that's been in place is confusing, it's inconsistent, it's costly, and it's provided little uh, environmental benefit. And from what I've heard, uh, entities really just want certainty. And I think that's what I've heard from the witnesses uh, today. Um, the two agencies released in March 2014 a proposed rule that would clarify the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act and provided that um, requested certainty. And so to me, it's quite simply, it's a proposed rule. It's not a final rule. Uh, there's a lot that's gone into the process. You've already explained that there have been a couple of extensions to allow for additional comments and, and consideration. I can't actually think of a more public process than has been engaged um, in this in this rulemaking. And from what I uh, further understand about the rulemaking process, um, that agencies take the comments that are received like you are doing. You have hearings and consultations with a broad swath of interested parties, and then you make modifications to the proposed rule before you issue the final rule. That is where we are right now. And I think we have heard uh, from some of my colleagues that the gross exaggerations that have been made about the scope uh, of the rule are, in fact, that they are exaggerations. And so I'm glad that you're here again today to clarify for us what is in consideration and what is not. I want to I just want to point out that in Maryland, 59 percent of the, our streams have no other streams flowing into them. 19 percent don't flow year-round. And under the varying interpretations of the recent Supreme Court decisions, these smaller bodies are among those for which the extent of Clean Water Act protections has been questioned. And so um, the EPA says that basically nearly 4 million Marylanders, and that is about 70 percent of our population, receive some of our drinking water from areas that contain these smaller streams. Uh, and seven, as I said, 70 percent of Marylanders get our drinking water from sources that rely on headwater or seasonal streams. We, in fact, in our state, are welcoming this, uh, this clarity. Um, and so in view of that fact, I am proud that Maryland joined over 30 states, and so I am a little confused, 30, 34, like we have 64 states, but 30 states have joined in asking the Supreme Court to uphold broad legal protections for small tributa tributaries and their adjacent wetlands. And so I share with, um, uh, with Senator Whitehouse that this is not a perfect uh, scenario, but we shouldn't let the, um, the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I wonder if you could just comment uh, for me in the brief time that I uh, have left uh, the agricultural exemptions that you have told this committee about before and the fast tracking process that the Army Corps will put into place to make sure that discharges associated with agricultural activities um, will not have the kind of impact that some of our farmers perceive. I will take that one, Congresswoman. Um, the, the agricultural exemptions that are currently exist in the Clean Water Act are 
are still there. Um, that's unchanged by this rule, and they include agriculture stormwater discharges, the return flows that the administrator talked about earlier, construction and maintenance of, of uh, farm and stock ponds, um, maintenance of drainage ditches, upland soil and water conservation policies. These are all still in place, and they continue to be in place as a result of this rule. Time has expired. Uh, Senator Fisher, you have five minutes. 